The following program is a Channel 5 Spanish simulcast. As the people of India mourn the death of Indira Gandhi, religious violence continues to spread across the country. Channel 5 News at 10, the number one primetime news hour in Los Angeles. Now, Emmy Award winning Hal Fishman, Debbie Davison, Larry McCormick, Joe Butita with sports, and the entire Channel 5 News team. Good evening. Six major cities in India have been hit by a wave of violence as the shock of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's assassination spreads across the country. Lynchings, beatings, and arson have resulted in more than 150 reported killings. Thousands of people have been injured. Much of the fighting is in the capital city of New Delhi, and many of the victims are Sikhs. We have a satellite report for you from India. Scores of cars belonging to Sikhs were burned. Most taxi drivers in Delhi are Sikhs, proving easy targets for angered Hindus. Rioters set more than 60 houses alight, throwing stones at Sikh property and damaging everything in sight. Many Sikhs left their homes and went into hiding, abandoning their belongings, which became easy targets for the looting and rioting mob. Heavily armed troops moved into eight provincial Indian cities and the capital, taking command of the worst hit areas. Ordinary police forces were overburdened and could not cope with the situation. The troops were under orders to shoot on sight to avoid any further bloodshed and a deepening of the present crisis. Mrs. Gandhi's body was carried on top of an army gun carriage to her childhood home, where she'll lie in state until her funeral on Saturday. The chief mourner was her son Rajiv, who the day before was sworn in as the new prime minister. He stood by the body while hundreds of officials paid their last respects. A line more than a mile long formed outside the house. The long wait was too much for some and they began to try to force their way past security police. Shortly after these pictures were taken, they broke down the steel barriers and stampeded towards the house before being forced back by club-wielding police. In the chaos, some 70 people were injured. Secretary of State George Shultz will be among the host of world leaders who will attend Mrs. Gundy's funeral on Saturday. Before leaving, Mr. Shultz saw to it that a formal protest was lodged with the Soviet Embassy in response to a Soviet claim that the United States may have been behind the assassination. A State Department spokesman says that charge is absurd and irresponsible. A plot to assassinate the president of Honduras, President Roberto Suazo Cordova, was smashed by the FBI today. Eight suspects were arrested in Miami after an undercover FBI agent posed as a man who could organize the proposed assassination team. Authorities are also seeking a ninth suspect who is apparently serving as the Honduran military attache in Chile. Automatic weapons were also seized in today's raids. The suspects are described as staunch anti-communists. One man lost millions when the Honduran government nationalized his cement business. 760 pounds of cocaine also were seized. The authorities say that was intended as part of the payment to the hit team. Locally, hundreds of demonstrators turned out to protest the appearance of the Salvadoran president, Jose Napoleon Duarte. Duarte is in Los Angeles to speak to the Inter-American Press Association and Stan Chambers reports. Tonight, about 300 people are attending this dinner at the Century Plaza Hotel. President Duarte is speaking before the Inter-American Press Association in the Los Angeles Ballroom. Before the dinner, more than 200 people demonstrated against the Duarte appearance outside the Century Plaza Hotel. Those carrying signs and chanting anti duarte slogans are from the U.S. Committee in solidarity with the people of El Salvador, and many carried black crosses. Uh, the local peasants are being killed and, and, and slaughtered, and this bombing has increased since President Duarte has taken power. And uh, people, uh, the death squads are still operating in El Salvador. Uh, we know this uh, in the Catholic community from our own missionaries who report to us what's going on down there. I don't think it's getting any better for the people in El Salvador, and I think Duarte is a convenient, unfortunately, because he was a good man once, a convenient cover for a very, very dangerous increase in, uh, in bombing, especially human rights violations in general. President Duarte was accompanied by many members of his government at the head table. 
In answering the complaints of those opposed to his regime, Doherty said earlier, you can't expect a miracle overnight. His speech tonight was delivered in Spanish. After his Los Angeles speech tonight, President Doherty continues his American tour. He'll fly on to Kansas, then to Florida for other appearances before returning to El Salvador. From the Century Plaza Hotel, Stan Chambers, Channel 5, News at 10. Earlier today, President Duarte said that rebel forces are destroying the economy of his country. Duarte also said that he is working toward restoring peace in El Salvador. Steve Lentz has that part of the story. Salvadoran President Jose Napoleon Duarte held a closed-door breakfast meeting attended by Mayor Bradley, Charlton Heston, and members of the L.A. business community. At a hastily called news conference after the breakfast, Duarte said enemies of his administration, most notably left-wing guerrillas who are fighting Duarte's U.S. government-supported troops, are trying to continue civil unrest in El Salvador while he works for peace. If the destruction keeps on going, if the, if the guerrillas keep on destroying bridges and destroying the lights and destroying the crops and destroying uh, all the bases of the economy, I would say, sure. But they're damaging the people, not the government. And this is perhaps the biggest historical mistake they're making. Duarte would not answer whether he preferred the Reagan administration or a Mondale administration to offer the most support for his government. There was a suggestion he would not be in power if not for U.S. military and economic aid. Will there be a ceasefire anytime soon in El Salvador, one which Duarte has called for? Right now he says, I don't know, but what we have to do is continue the peace talks which began at La Palma in that country in October. To try to further that, the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions here in Los Angeles is issuing invitations to each faction to meet here in this city in November. At the Century Plaza Hotel, Steve Lentz, Channel 5, News at 10. In other news, former Glendale Police Sergeant Michael Haley was acquitted by a Los Angeles jury today of five counts of child molestation. Haley had served with the Glendale Police Department for 12 years and spent much of his time as a counselor and a basketball coach at a local YMCA. Haley was accused of molesting three teenage boys. Today, he rejoiced at the verdict that he was found not guilty. I just, uh, at this point, just praise the Lord for all of the people that were with me and all of the, the, uh, the love that I shared with them and uh, that, you know, the, uh, the jury saw that this was not fair or not true. Love you, Jay. Praise the Lord. I think the turning point came in probably the second day of trial when the jury had a chance to see these three supposed victims. And when they were cross-examined and the true story came out and when they admitted lying and when there were constant inconsistencies in their testimony, I think that's when the jury trial was won. Haley says that he would like to return to police work with the Glendale Department, but he doubts that they will take him back. RTD officials today deadlocked on a proposal to raise the bus fares. The proposed fare hikes range from 10 cents to 50 cents over and above the current 50 cent fare. Authorities are expected to raise fares next year to offset the losses of funds from Proposition A. A key provision of California's death penalty law was struck down today by the California State Supreme Court. Until now, juries have not been told that an individual convicted of uh, first-degree murder and given a death sentence could be pardoned by the governor. But they had been told that a life sentence could result in a parole. Well, the state Supreme Court claimed this is a classic example of a misleading half-truth. Today's ruling could affect the sentences of at least 20 people who are currently on California's death row. The California State Supreme Court said that the juries who sentenced these prisoners may have improperly speculated on what the governor might do, rather than focusing on the appropriate penalty. In less than one hour, 52-year-old Margie Velma Barfield will be injected with lethal drugs and executed for the murders of four people. Mrs. Barfield requested a Chinese, uh, some Chinese food today. She had some cheese crackers and a Coke in place of her last meal. And her state of mind is reportedly said to be quite good. Uh, we have more for you in this report. With time running out, Velma Barfield has been preparing for death by writing last letters and by praying, according to prison officials. She has been moved to a cell close to the execution chamber. Until her scheduled death at 2 a.m. Friday, prison guards will keep her under close observation. She will never have another private moment. About 1.30, four correctional officers will escort Barfield down the hall to the preparation room next to the execution chamber. 
there should be placed on a gurney with lined ankle and wrist restraints. And if she has any last requests, the warden will, will record that on tape. Then she'll be wheeled into the execution chamber. With needles already in both wrists, she will be injected with sodium pentothal and will go to sleep. Four media representatives will watch as another drug is administered to stop her breathing and then her heart. It takes approximately five minutes for death to occur. Relatives of victims killed by Velma Barfield offer little sympathy as her hour of death nears. She is a dangerous person.